Well, good morning, everybody. As I said when we started this service a few minutes late, we do apologize for a few of the te technical difficulties and the video quality is a little lower than it normally is for our live stream on Sundays. But you know what? We're going to preach about Jesus Christ today, and so I know God's got a lot of good stuff to do. Amen? Uh, kids, I want to spend a few minutes before we jump into the sermon, and what we've been doing is been giving kind of a pre-sermon, about five minutes long, just for you. And so children, I want you to gather around, and I want you to listen real carefully uh, to what you're going to learn today from Jesus, from the scriptures. we got a really important lesson for you today, kids. And this is one that I really hope you will take with you for the rest of your lives because some of the things we're going to be discussing are issues that are going to be with you throughout your entire life. And your parents are going to be learning this exact same message. And so when you see in just a moment what your parents are learning when they're listening to me, it's the same thing you're going to be learning. Do you know what a treasure is? You ever think of what a treasure is? I know my kids love to watch the show Wild Kratts. I don't know if you've heard of that show. But in Wild Kratts, sometimes they'll go and they'll search for buried treasure. Or they'll look for hidden treasure. Or they'll find a treasure chest somewhere. A treasure is something that you really, really, really want. Maybe it's something that's very expensive. Maybe it's something that you just really, really love and want to hold on to. There are lots of things in our life that we can treasure. There's lots of things in our life that we can treasure. What's something in your life, children? What's something in your life that you treasure, that you just love so much? I got a few of them for you. Let me throw out some. I bet you that you treasure your parents. You treasure your parents? That's a good thing to treasure your parents. They're wonderful people in your life, and they love you very much. You love your parents. Do you treasure your teachers? I know my kids treasure their teachers. We're so grateful for their teachers. You treasure your friends. Yeah, don't you just love good friends when they're there for you? These types of treasures are people. It's not like the treasure you find on a sunken ship, but they're people, and they're very important people in your life, that it's good to have a special place in your heart to just love them and cherish them and be grateful for you. But you want to know something funny? You want to know what people do sometimes? And maybe you've done this before. Sometimes... We treasure stuff and things that we have. What are some of the stuff in your life that maybe you've treasured before? You know, things. Have you ever treasured a toy? I think sometimes we treasure toys, don't we? Some people, they just love their toys. They just, they love, that's all they want. They just want to hold on to those toys they have. Could you, imagining, tr could you imagine treasuring a toy? How about iPads? <laughs> I'm thinking of my kids right now, so maybe the other kids that are listening aren't the exact same, but I know for my kids sometimes they treasure their iPad time, and they look forward to it. And the way I know they treasure is because sometimes they get really, really upset when they don't get a chance to look at the iPad like they thought they were going to. You know what sometimes people do It's so silly? They treasure money. They want to hold on to their money super tight and just kind of cling on to it and never let go of it. Isn't that a silly thing to treasure? Now, i got a question for you. The first treasures we talked about were people, your friends, uh, your family, your parents. The second treasure we talked about was stuff, iPad, toys, money. Do you think it's a good thing to treasure toys and money and iPads? No, it's not a good thing to treasure those things. You want to know why? It's kind of silly if you treasure those things because those things can all break. Those things can all get lost or broken or something can happen to them and they can get taken away from you. And so if you treasure those things and you just want to hold on to all that stuff, well, one day when they break, you're going to be super sad, aren't you? Listen to what Jesus says. He teaches us about this. He says, don't store up for yourselves treasures where moth and rust can eat them and destroy them. He says, don't store up for yourself treasures where it can all break and get taken away from you. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because treasures in heaven can never break. They can never be taken away from you. Now, kids, I bet you know the answer to this question. What is the greatest treasure in heaven? Do you know? The greatest treasure in heaven is Jesus. When Jesus is telling you, don't treasure stuff on this earth, but treasure things in heaven, what he's saying is that the most important thing about you children is that you learn to develop and grow in your love of Jesus Christ. That you learn how to wake up every day and the thing that you first think about in your day, and I hope your parents are doing the same thing, the thing you first think about in your day and the thing you most look forward to is to learn more about Jesus. Here's why. You know why? Because Jesus is not like a toy. See, toys can break and be taken away from you. Jesus can never break. 
He can never be taken away from you. He can, you can never lose him. Even if one day you were lost, even if one day you were scared about something, Jesus can't be taken away from you. He's always with you. He is the greatest treasure in your entire life. What Jesus wants to teach you today is that there's lots of good treasures in your life. Treasuring your mom and dad, that's a wonderful thing. Treasuring good teachers, that is good. But for your life, the number one thing I want you to treasure, and that Jesus wants you to treasure above every other thing, is Jesus himself. Learn to love Jesus because he loves you so much. You know what one thing you could do with this this week? Why don't you try this week, every morning when you wake up, the first thing that you do when you find your mom and dad and you begin your day, before you eat, before you play, before you do anything else, the first thing you can do is say, Jesus, today I want you to be my greatest treasure. Can you do that? And what I would love for you to do, kids, is I would actually love for you to help your parents. And I want you to show them that this week, every morning, you're going to wake up and your first thought, and you're going to say to your parents, parents, help me. Jesus, I want you to be my greatest treasure today. Because you know why? Sometimes parents need reminding of that as well. And kids, I think you can show them how to do it well. Can you do that for me? All right. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, and then parents, we're going to jump into that same passage, all right? So Heavenly Father, make much of our time today as we dig into your word. God, would you be honored? Would you be glorified? Would your word come to life? I pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A very famous pastor uh, in the world of uh, seminary and theologians. He's known as the doctor, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones tells the story of a farmer. And this for farmer came home one day and he was happy to tell his family, his wife, that their best cow had given birth to two brand new calves, one red and one white. And he said, you know what, honey? I got a great plan. I have been led by the Lord to dedicate one of these calves to the Lord. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise these calves together. And then when the time comes to sell them, I'll take some of the money. We'll keep it for ourselves. And then some of the money from the other calf, and we'll give it directly to the Lord. And his wife turned to him and said, Honey, which one are you going to dedicate to the Lord? But he answered, he said, you know, There's no need to decide that right now. We'll decide that when the time comes. Well, a few months later, that farmer came home to his wife. He said, Honey, I got bad news. One of the calves has died. He said, it's the Lord's calf. The Lord's calf has died. The wife looked at him and said, I thought you said that you hadn't decided which one was the Lord's calf. And the farmer said, oh, no, 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 no. I knew right away it was always going to be the white calf that was going to be for the Lord, and it's the white calf that's died. Now, I start that way by a bit of humor to introduce our theme for today money. Did you know Jesus spoke about money more than almost any other topic he spoke about? He certainly spoke about it more than he spoke about heaven and hell. Jesus was very concerned with the way we handle our money and our finances. It seems that if you read the Bible consistently, there seems to be this theme that how you handle your money, how you view your money, how you steward your money, it's a very important word, how you steward your money, is a direct reflection of how you're doing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus very consistently pointed us that way. He repeatedly talked about that money more than anything can become a huge idol in our life. Consider some of these passages. Matthew chapter 19, verses 21 to 22. Jesus is speaking to the rich young man. And what does he say? He says, Jesus says to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. What's the rich young man do? When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That one's tough to hear. How about Luke 6, 25? Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Luke 12, 16 to 21. He told them a parable. This is a great parable from Jesus. He says, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store all my crops. He said, I know what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample good laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, you fool. This night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? 
so is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. You know, passages like these make many Western followers of Christ very uneasy. And what we normally begin to do is we, we feel uncomfortable and we start to try to justify these passages and justify our lifestyle. And we begin to ask really complicated questions about the text. Like, maybe there's more context going on in this text than what Jesus says pretty directly. Maybe there's some other nuance that doesn't quite apply to me and I can keep living my life pretty much the exact way I've been living it. One of the reasons we feel uncomfortable about it is because we know that many of us in the Western world live in incredible extravagance. But you want to know something? If, if you want to summarize Jesus' teaching on money, I think it might sound something like this. Think of money like dynamite. Money is like dynamite. It's incredibly powerful when used in the right way. And it's incredibly deadly when taken lightly. If you have it and you build your life upon it, it will kill you. If you don't have it and you build your life upon the pursuit of it, it will kill you. I've titled this message today, Set Free to Worship Christ Alone. And the question we should be asking is, set free from what? And the answer is, set free from the slavery and the tyranny that money holds over many of us. So let's dig into our passage today, and then we're going to try to understand what Jesus is teaching us. Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 24. Jesus, continuing the Sermon on the Mount, says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Nobody can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, let's go through that first. What I want to do is I want to walk through that, pull out some notes for us, and then I want to try to apply it into our life. Verses 19 and 20 are really fascinating statements by Jesus. And there's this play on words happening in the original text, which is kind of hard to see in our English translations. And what it really is saying in the Greek kind of sounds like this. Do not treasure treasures on earth, but treasure treasures in heaven. Our English translation says do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but it kind of reads do not treasure treasures on earth. This is all about what you treasure. This is all about what you seek to fill up on and what you seek to maximize in your life. And we're all treasuring something, aren't we? Some of us treasure fine food. And most of you know, most of you, if you look at your friends, if you look at the people in your life, you can pretty much, if you know somebody fairly well, know the things in their life they treasure. Some people treasure fine food and nice eating experiences. And you know they treasure it because it's the number one thing they post about on Facebook all the time. And you always know, you can see them constantly spending their money on these things and getting excited about these eating opportunities. Some people treasure their family, kind of like I talked about to the children. And that's a wonderful thing to treasure. We should have a great treasure for our family. And, and you know that because you constantly look at your life and you see them rearranging their schedule to be with their children, to be with their wife, to, to be connected with their family. And certainly, some people treasure money. Your bank account will reveal how you treasure money. If you have a consistent habit of accumulation rather than distribution, perhaps you've been treasuring money. Don't treasure that, says Jesus. D don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. The thing about moth and rust, see, in the first century, uh, the way they handled money and what was considered mammon, your entire wealth at the time, Mammon was much more than just cash. Money oftentimes in your wealth was built on stuff. Like you might have fine metals or you might have lots of different types of cloth. And, and money and all these things were worth different amounts of money. And you'd store these things in your home. But the thing about having all your wealth tied up into cloth is that you could one day have a few moths tear holes in a lot of it. And it could be gone. And if you're storing all your money in, in copper and fine metals in your house in the back, well... You know, if a little dampness gets in your treasure chest, it could eat away the treasure right away. So Jesus looking at first century people saying, you know what I'm talking about. 
How many of you have had a certain amount of wealth tied up into these fabrics, into these metals, and you open the chest one day, and all of a sudden it's been destroyed? You know that because you've lived it. He says you would be foolish to build your life and the entire foundation of your life and to treasure these things that can so easily be taken away from you. Don't treasure those things. The reality is, though, for many of us, even though we don't hold our treasures in uh, cloth and in different metals, we treat our money the same way. And if we're honest with ourselves today, most of us are treasuring money in one way or another. He says, don't do that. Rather, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. What does that mean? Interesting language. It seems pretty easy, right? Store treasures in heaven. But actually, what does it mean? What does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? I think what this means is to have the mindset that truly the greatest thing in your entire life, above every other thing that you could ever value, is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that the posture of your life is set in such a way that you are seeking to maximize your knowledge of him, your love of him, your faith in him, your pursuit of him, your, your sharing him with other people. You're posturing your life in such a way that you're seeking to maximize that pursuit of God in your life, to live a godly life and to honor the name of Jesus Christ, and that you can clearly see in your life that the number one thing you're seeking to maximize in your life is your love and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. That's what it means to store treasures in heaven. Remember, heaven revolves around Jesus. He's the centerpiece of the whole thing. Verse 22 to 24 is really fascinating. It, it, it starts talking about the eye and how the eye is the lamp of the body. In, in first century, uh, there was this kind of mythology. Actually, it was more like a philosophy that got handled, handed down from guys like Aristotle. The eye actually was believed to have light inside of it, and that the way the eye worked is it would project light outwards, and that would help you actually see, much like your iPhone might have a light on it and shines out. That's how they thought the eye actually worked back in the day. And Jesus takes that, he, he spins it, he does this kind of like twist. Jesus is doing this all the time, by the way. And he, and he literally angles the, the light coming from your eye backwards. <laughs> and he says, the eye, rather than looking out, it actually shines a light inwards. And his point is this, he says, you are constantly being scanned by God internally for your heart. Did you notice how Jesus switched it to the heart, where your treasure is, there your heart will be? He says, God's looking at your heart, and, and you can have everybody fooled. You can outwardly live as if you're the most generous person in the entire world. But God sees your heart, and, and the light that shines on your heart, God sees, and he can tell if you actually are treasuring money above him. And then he finishes that part where he says, how great is that darkness? You know, when I was telling the kids about the silliness of holding on to money, it almost seems silly. When you consider what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross and all that he went through to love you, it, to think about hoarding money and clinging to it, doesn't it just sound silly? Why would we do that? Think of who Jesus is and what he's done, and yet every person I know does it. Everyone, how great is that darkness? And he says, you know, it's killing you. Your love of money is literally, slowly killing you and distracting you from Jesus Christ. He says, you cannot serve God and money. you got to choose one. The word for money there, like I said, is mammon, and it's getting after everything that you own. It's all your assets. It's all your wealth. It's all of you. And he says, if your sense of your wealth, your sense of the direction of your life, your sense of what you're about and where you're going, if, if it all revolves around your mammon, around your stuff, and that's how you're building your life and your security and your faith, and you're, you're spending lots of time planning that, but very little time planning your growth in the knowledge and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which foundation are you building on, right? If you're building a foundation for your life, it's about your mammon and how you're going to secure yourself and your family based on that, that's one way to live your life, and that ends up in a terrible place. Brokenness in this life and hell in the next. You can't serve God in money. But if you build your life on the knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ, and you build upwards from there, and you understand that money and mammon is simply a tool that God's given you to be used for good purposes, then there's life in this life, treasure in this life, and treasure everlasting with Christ. That's the text. Now, let me try to make this real practical for us. 
You know, in the Old Testament, there's this very uncomfortable word that no one really likes to talk about in the church, but it's a very important word. It's the word tithe. The Old Testament, there was a 10% tithe. Tithe literally means a tenth. And the tithe was that all the people of God, everyone who proclaimed faith in Yahweh, the God of the Bible, would take 10% of their overall income, set it aside for the work of the temple, the work of the Lord, and everything that the Lord did through uh, the Levitical priests. Actually, that 10% was just a baseline. Throughout a year, throughout a three-year cycle, every person of God would actually be giving away, on average, about 23% of their overall income both to temple services, but then also to many different festivals and things that were happening in the religious life of the community. Now, in the New Testament, we're freed from the law. So in, in the sense that we're not earning God's favor. Anytime you follow any of the laws of God, you're not trying to earn God's favor. But listen to what Jesus says in Luke eleven forty two. He's talking to the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, you Pharisees, because you tithe mint and rue and every herb. In other words, they're the kind of people, they tithe on everything. And, but you neglect justice and the love of God. So your heart's totally wrong with me, but you tithe mint and rue. Now listen to what he says. He says, these you ought to have done while not neglecting the others. In other words, he's saying, yes, tithe. That's a good thing. You should be doing that. There's a reason I gave you that law. But you don't do it at neglect of the other things of the heart justice for the poor, caring for people in need. It's a both-and thing. That's why Jesus says, I'm scanning your heart. I'm trying to find out, do you really love me, or are you just doing a law? Because you heard I told you to do it. But in that passage, he verifies that the tithe was a good law. In other words, it's right to tithe. Park, did you know it's a good practice for every follower of Christ? As a baseline, to set aside 10% of your overall annual income and give it directly to the Lord through the church? And then to grow on top of that and to be giving more and more and more away. The entire book of 3 John, if you read 3 John, you know what that's about? That's about supporting traveling missionaries and just having an open, generous lifestyle. When someone comes around and they're raising support to get around the, the work of the kingdom of God, give to them. Don't make them struggle to raise their support. Just, just pour it on them. Everybody. And then call your friends and tell them to give to them. That's what 3 John's about. Thank you for giving this to traveling missionaries who are doing hard work for the kingdom of God. You know in our church how many people we have who are raising financial support either to do college ministry or to go overseas as global missionaries? They shouldn't even have to do the work of raising support. We should just be coming to them and flooding them with this. Why? Well, because we're Christians. We set aside 10 to 23% of our income on any given year, and we set it aside for the work of the Lord. We give it to the church, and then we give extravagantly to the Lord. Did you know the average American Christian gives less than 2% to kingdom work? Less than 2%. The reason is for many things. I think one of it is because we try to justify passages like the one we're reading today. We try to look for some contextual error. We, we can get around what the Bible says and actually live the lives we kind of want to live because our hearts reveal what we really value in this life. And what we really value is giving 2% to the Lord and keeping the other 98 for ourselves. My guess is that many of you see this as a burden. 10%? 23%? Get real, Wraith. Get real Bible. <laughs> Get real Bible. See, this is where the Bible comes into play. What is it in our heart that clings so tightly to money? Why, when we talk about money in the church, do many of us immediately say, I don't, I don't like this? Why is it that we want to only give 2% and not honor the Lord's clear commands and to live with such open generosity that you can change the world? We can't live in a bit less in order to submit to Jesus and his orders for our life. Remember, we don't do this to earn salvation with God. God's already given us salvation through Jesus Christ. It's not like this is a guilt trip and you've got to do it to earn anything. We do this out of an abundance of love and of Christ in our life. You know, over the last few years already in our church... I, I don't know the numbers. I, I, as a pastor, there's a big firewall between me and how much each person gives and who gives. I have no idea who gives what. That, there's just a firewall between me and th those numbers, which is a good thing. I, I don't need that information. But I can tell you this. We've been a very generous church. Over the last few years, we've been able to give and bless and use the money that's come into this church to do incredible work. I'm thinking of uh, writing checks to ministries like Caris, who supports 
women with unplanned pregnancies and gives them Christian opportunities to learn about Jesus and to get good help for them in those situations. Ministries like Pacific Garden Mission. We've written checks to Daystar and to Chicago Westside Christian Academy. We've uh, gone out and supported many global workers. We've created an adoption fund. We've created a global fund. These things are amazing. And I'm so grateful for the generosity of this church. Honestly, in a season of COVID-19, I've watched many of the members of this church step up and provide. And just before anyone comes to me and tells me their need, the, the people in small groups are just helping one another with thousands of dollars. What do you need? Let me help you. Here's this. What do you need? Let me help you. Here's this. I've seen it take place. I love it. That's the kingdom of God at work. But we haven't arrived yet. Could you imagine the avalanche of kingdom work that could be released if every Christian at Park Community Church, as a baseline, just took 10% right off the top and gave it to the church? Could you imagine? I don't know what percentage we're at right now. It's probably closer to the 2%. I, we're, we're like many churches in America. I'm guessing it's closer to the 2% than it is the 10 or the 23%. Could you imagine if it was the 10%? Imagine the work we could do. We could fully fund the Park 100 today. I think we could, uh, we could fully fund the Park 100. I did the math with our global pastor a while ago. The cost is going to cost Park Community Church to truly send off 100 missionaries to unreached people groups in the world. It's going to take a lot of money, more than we have right now. We could fund it today. We, I know of a ministry, a, a church in Cincinnati last year. There's a ministry out there that helps churches pay off people's medical debt in the city of Chicago. Did you know medical debt can be generational? I mean, that can actually send generations of poverty through families. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? And there's a ministry, and what they do is they will, they're a team of attorneys, they'll go and they'll fight on people's behalf to lower their medical debt in a city. And if you give $100 to, the, to this group of lawyers, they'll turn it into $10,000 paying off people's medical debt because they can go to the courts and get their medical debt lowered. So a $100 gift can lower $10,000 of medical debt for someone in the city. One church in Cincinnati this year, they paid off $46.5 million of people's medical debt across the city of Cincinnati. We could do that. We could do that. Wouldn't you like that headline in the Chicago Tribune? Park Community Church pays off $40 million of medical debt for people that don't even go to their church. Why? Because poverty is an issue in this city. Generational poverty is an issue in this city. And we're the people of God. And we give extravagantly, just the way Jesus has given to us. And so we bless people. I'd like that headline. We could partner with ministries that purchase properties in the city. That give people a chance to own. Generations of folks who have never been able to own a home. Never been able to get approved for a mortgage. We could get them approved. We could start a new generation New generate break break cycles of poverty by, by helping them purchase homes and, and own land. You know how important owning is to creating cycles of wealth within a family? We could do that in this city. If we actually obeyed what Jesus told us to do. You know, it's not just your money. It's you as well. Jesus is after your heart. And, and we don't just need the money. We, we then need you to come around and be a player. Be, 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 an, be an advocate. Step in. I can't run this stuff. I don't have the first clue about any of the stuff I just talked about. I just know it's possible. But you know how to do it. You guys got gifts that are way bigger than mine in all these areas. And you have a hundred ideas I've never even dreamed about. And we could do it. There's so much talent in this church. And there's a lot of money too. And if we put those things together for kingdom work. Man, COVID-19... This season will be a season where the city of Chicago would say, what happened during that season? There was tremendous loss, but the church shined. They stepped up in ways we've never seen them step up before. Church, the reason churchgoers often have a very hard time doing this is not because the church has a marketing issue. It's because we have a worship issue. <laughs> the church doesn't need new extravagant ways of communicating how to give more to the church. or We don't need a new pitch for where all your money is going to go or... It's a worship issue. At the end of the day, it's looking at Jesus Christ. It's knowing what he's done for you on the cross. It's looking at the extravagant love that Jesus poured out for you on the cross when he died for you and gave you a new life and saved you from the pit of hell and established you on a new identity that you are known and loved, adopted into his family, and no one can ever take that from you. 
You could hit poverty, and Jesus loves you fully and will always provide for you. You could hit wealth, and Jesus loves you just the same and he'll always provide for you. He's yours, and he can't be taken from you because of his work on the cross on your behalf. And we, out of an abundance of knowing Christ, get to now step into a new life, not of accumulation and hoarding, but of distribution and giving. How do we do that? Let me give you three quick application points. One, I think we need to repent of materialism. Let me, let me, let me change that. I need to repent of materialism. It, it just works its ugly head into my life. I'm bombarded by it everywhere I go. Do you know how hard this is to do when you're just bombarded by buy, 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 buy? Man, we get fooled so easy into building our foundation on stuff we own rather than on Jesus. But repentance is, is real work. It means changing something about the way you're living your life. Got to increase in our generosity. As we get older, the plan for your life, think about what you're planning for your future. When you think about your retirement years. Most of us, when we think retirement, the first place we go is, what's our financial situation going to be like? Why is that our first move? Well, it's because we value mammon more than anything else. What if we had to plan for a life of, man, what, now I hit my retirement years. What's my faith in Jesus going to look like? And how am I planning for that now? What's my relationship with Jesus? And how am I going to be giving away more and more and more of my stuff rather than hoarding more and more of it? We should be getting older and increasing in our generosity, not increasing in our hoarding. We should be teaching our kids this stuff. Kids need to learn this from a very early age, what it means to give to the church, what it means to save appropriately, what it means to not cling to and love money. And it can't just be empty words you teach your kids. If you're not modeling it, they'll see through it like that, and they'll become just like you are. <laughs> we become like our parents, don't we? Model this for your children. Park, I hope this is a bit of a turning point for us. There's a lot of good kingdom work to do. I think this passage hits us in a very important place today. I pray that it's moved you. Let me pray. Oh God, let your word be true. Holy Spirit, bring about a very true and real conviction in us right now. That you are more worthy than anything we could cling on to in this life. More worthy than our money. More worthy than our homes. More worthy than anything. It's Jesus. That's all we want. We want to lift his name up. And so, God, help us to repent, repent of materialism. We blend in with the world so much. We should stand out like a sore thumb. We should be those people that are just standing out because we stand for Jesus. We don't build our life on stuff, but we do it. And so help us turn from that, Jesus. Help us to grow in the love of Christ. Amen.
us to have lives that reflect the heart of Zion. Amen. Well, once more, as a community of followers of Jesus, we are going to speak together words of worship to close out our service this morning. Let us speak this benediction together from the book of you, from the book of Jude, uh, as community uh, to close out our time this morning. Repeat after me. Now to him who is able. Now to him who is able. Able to keep you from stumbling. Able to keep you from stumbling. And to present you blameless. And to present you blameless. Before the presence. Before the presence. Of his glory with great joy. Of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior. To the only God our Savior. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty. Be glory, majesty. Dominion and authority. Dominion and authority. Before all time. Before all time. And now and forever. Amen. And now and forever. Amen. Go and be south wind.